Good morning and welcome to the third day of the Future of the American Child Journalism Training for National Press Foundation. Um, before we get started, I'd like to thank our sponsors, the W.K. Kellogg Foundation, the David and Lucille Packard Foundation, and the Heising Simons Foundation. We're continuing our conversation about child welfare and reform and innovation. We've heard several prominent themes over the past few days from our speakers about the need for innovation, the need for uh, uh, transformation really, but also we've heard about the impact and the power of lived experience when it comes to understanding the experience of children in the system and trying to come up with solutions for some of the challenging problems. This morning's speaker embodies so much of those themes, and we're greatly privileged to have joining us this morning, Rebecca Jones Gaston. She is the commissioner of the Administration for Children, Youth, and Families at the Department of Health and Human Services. I say she embodies these themes because she herself was in the child welfare system. She was adopted, or I started out in foster care, I believe, and uh, eventually was adopted. But she brings a wealth of experience, including most recently before coming to DC, uh, as running the Oregon State Child Welfare Department. And I believe you've also, uh, you ran this, this, the uh, department in Maryland as well. Is that correct? We're yes. Not hearing you. Oh, okay, great. Great, great. Good morning, Rebecca. Thank you so much for joining Good us. I, I really appreciate it. And it's indeed an honor to have someone at your level and with your perspective join us today. So I wanted to start by asking you to, to really start at the beginning. Tell us about your uh, story and your entry into the system. Uh, well, first of all, good morning, everyone. Uh, it is uh, good to join you. Sorry, I'm not there in person. I just couldn't make it happen. Um, but uh, yeah, so my, uh, I have time to say my, my journey with child welfare started at conception. Um, I was uh, born uh, to single parents, uh, likely in college, not entirely sure. Um, but uh, in southern Minnesota and then placed um, placed into foster care um, and then adopted um, while still an infant. Um, I was adopted. Uh, I'm uh, African-American and uh, was adopted by a uh, white family and uh, grew up in Iowa in a little tiny farming community full of Norwegians. Um, and where I was the uh, person of color in my family and in my community. Um, and so that really, um, in many ways, uh, led me to a, ask a lot of questions. Um, I was also the only person that I knew that was adopted um, and that had had my story um, growing up. And so I knew um, early on that I wanted to um, work with kids and families who had had similar experiences as ours. Um, I had no idea it was called child welfare at the time uh, and uh, ventured off to uh, DC following high school for my undergrad uh, and then ultimately um, landed uh, in uh, Philadelphia getting my master's in social work. And off, off I went. Um, I've had the pleasure of the pleasure and pain of being a uh, social worker on on the um, on the ground doing the direct work it um, absolutely has informed everything that I do and uh, learned that uh, there's lots of room for improvement and lots of reasons people come to the work both as, workforce, but also lots of reasons why families end up engaged with, with the child welfare system. And so my, uh, my driver has been my experience. Um, I, I value having people at the table um, who have experienced the system as well 
um, because it, it, it adds a particular perspective around what works, what doesn't work, um, and things to consider that um, we oftentimes sitting in policy seats um, can forget unless we've got that voice at the table with us. You know, I ask you in our prep conversations to think of maybe four or five story ideas that you wanted uh, journalists to consider. But before we get to that, I really wanted to, you to perhaps help us unpack some of the major themes in child welfare reform that are bubbling up today. And obviously one of them is um, abolitionists, the abolitionist yes. movement in child welfare. Tell us a little bit about what you, how you interpret it and what it means to the issue of reform. Yeah, so I, um, I absolutely understand um, where everyone's coming from in, in the concept of abolition. Um, the child welfare system itself um, wasn't created in its structure to actually help families stay together. Um, it was a system that was created to, you know, separate children um, from their families and um, and particularly children um, of families who were poor and um, of color. And so it it was is a system that was built on this premise of um, deserving and non-deserving, and um, it's. It's hard to imagine a system that over decades that's got all of these infrastructures and policies and regulations and statutes that drive it to do what it does. It's it's really hard to think about um, anything other than um, kind of dismantling it entirely and and creating something different. Um, now, while I absolutely agree we've got to dismantle, um, you know, major pieces of the system, for me, it's a balance. And I think this is actually where the um, folks um, supporting the abolition of child welfare really are, is, is to acknowledge its role in kind of policing families and figuring out what is it that we actually need to put in place in support of families and children and communities um, to replace it altogether. Um, and so it's in some ways a both and, that's how I see it, is let's dismantle um, the pieces that we know are um, destructive to families and aren't yielding the outcomes that we want and build up um, something different that actually helps um, families and children stay together and stay connected to their communities. I can't imagine the challenge of coming into a federal agency and being tasked with uh, bringing significant reform, but I want to ask you before we get to some of your worldview now, what do you feel were your successes or the things that you were able to accomplish in the state of Oregon that may have helped prepare you to take on this, comp this um, challenge? Yeah, and so I think, um... The premise I start in is um, I love being engaged in this work and I absolutely believe change is possible. Um, and in order to do that, you've got to actually have relationships and collaborations and partnerships and be able to speak truth. Um, I, uh, for better or worse, tend to be a very uh, transparent leader and am open to talking about what we what we get right and what we don't get right um, in the work of the system. But I think that one of the big pieces for me was, you know, engaging both with the workforce and uh, making sure that they are, um, they understand their value, um, but also set some really clear expectations for the quality of work and how we're engaging with each other and how we're engaging with the communities we serve. The other is, um, you know, uh, owning owning where we've got things wrong. Um, I think a, a huge part of um, the work in, Mar in um, Oregon was um, building, rebuilding a relationship with the tribes. There are nine federally recognized tribes. There is certainly a significant and serious impact that child welfare has had on tribal communities across the country and internationally as well um, around um, separating children from 
not only their families, but from their tribal communities and the loss of culture and connection and um, relationship has generational impacts. And being able to sit at a table and acknowledge um, the role the system has played in that is really important. Um, to have some honest, um, honest partnership and, um, and the other piece of it is, is um, you know, one of the things we did was engaged in, instead of the kind of quarterly or semi-annual meetings with various um, uh, at advisory groups, we started having monthly meetings and then, you know, and sometimes then quarterly and, and engaged in ad hoc conversations with the community we were serving to a, let them know what was going on and what we were doing, but also to uh, elicit um, input and guidance. And in Oregon, we created the vision for transformation. And that was done um, by listening to people and actually saying, what, what is it that we want for kids and families in Oregon? And then let's set our goal to that. And then what's the pathway to get there? And I think another key component was not being afraid of the conversation around equity um, and equitable out, the desire for equitable outcomes. And, and again, owning where we've had our impact um, on um, certain communities and then asking those communities to be partners with us as we um, try to do something different. Just two more questions and then I'll turn it over to you. Uh, one, I think one of the major themes that I have uh, encountered in talking with people like you is the prominence of the issue of race, racial disparities, uh, equity and access, et cetera. Uh, there are those who believe that there's a danger to having that be the, the main narrative in this discussion, because clearly, even when we think about just plain numbers, there are more white children in the system than there are children of color. But can you help us put Race, race and racial equity in this issue in the proper perspective? Um, well, I, I'll offer my perspective, whether it's proper or not. We, that, that, I'll leave that up to debate. Um, you know, disproportionate um, impact of child welfare, you know, we oftentimes talk about there's disproportionality in child welfare, and that means that um, that communities, so African-American communities, tribal communities, um, Hispanic communities, our children are represented in a higher proportion in child welfare than they are in the general population. And for tribal communities, and I don't, I should have the numbers right in front of me, but I don't, so we're gonna rely on my memory. So that's my little asterisk by the, by the dates, by the data, but I think tribal children are, three to four times um, higher represented in child welfare, uh, African-American children and black children, um, uh, one to two times higher. And yeah, it begs the question because you know the, the correlation that you might make is that, oh, well, abuse and neglect happen more often in those communities. And that indeed is actually not true. Um, so there's actually been quite a bit of research that's been done um, to show that um, abuse and neglect actually isn't more likely to happen um, by, um, by racial or ethnic um, groups. It is that they're more likely to be reported, more likely to then um, be screened in to then further involvement um, with the child welfare system. And then at every decision point, the the um, impact grows. And so frankly, the the disproportionality that um, child welfare experiences um, starts in the community with people making a decision about whether or not they need to call a child welfare hotline um, and report concerns about a about a child. And then it gets exacerbated in the decision points um, for families. And some of that is due to you know, the, the definition of maltreatment being really broad. And so when I say maltreatment, that includes abuse and neglect. And abuse oftentimes gets categorized as um, physical abuse. Um, you know, so physical harm, 
an injury, sexual abuse. Um, it could also be emotional abuse. And neglect oftentimes um, are characteristics that happen as a result of poverty and scarcity. Um, and, and, um, and so you end up getting families reported because they don't have housing or um, don't have access to food or, or something like that. And, um, and then there's all sorts of bias baked into um, the decisions that we make because I think everyone comes to this work, fully believe that everyone comes to this work with some desire to help and have an impact on children. And we want children to be okay. And oftentimes our lens of people being okay is our own lens. So, you know, do they have a home with a yard? Do they have running water? Do they have, you know, clean clothes every day? Um, and, you know, those, those things may be important, but they aren't necessarily the measure of whether or not a parent is parenting well. Um, and so um, with the fact that there is um, more likely to um, have poverty in uh, communities of color, you've public school systems, our, our educators and medical providers, we've also turned mandatory reporting into um, a thing that you do to in some sometimes CYA, um, where um, employers are saying you have if you if you suspect or wonder you have to call the child welfare abuse you know, child abuse hotline and while i you won't hear me say don't call a hotline <laughs> um i think one of the things that there's some opportunity to do to kind of plug into this conversation is to talk about what actually really is maltreatment what is child abuse and neglect? And what are the things that child welfare can and can't do? If you're worried about a child having access to food, reporting child abuse isn't necessarily the best and fastest path to help that family and child have access to food. It is a system that has over time become a kind of catch-all because people don't know where else to go and how else to connect families with resources and supports that they may need. And child welfare has its limitations because we are set up to respond to safety concerns. And that might be a conversation for another day about all the broad definitions of what safety means, but it isn't necessarily getting oftentimes to the crux of what a family might need in order to provide for their child, provide for their family, um, and that that isn't necessarily abuse that needs a policing system to come in and um, and separate children from their families. You know, and, that, and I'll stop there. Well, I was going to say this is the perfect setup for my final question to you, which is, so often the general public, when they think about this issue, the bottom line they reach is it costs 10 times more to, to remove a child from the family than it does to try to figure out a way to, to uh, keep that family together. At, but the issue of family reunification, providing support, kinship care, is so complicated. And what are your thoughts about ways to address this seeming sort of a lack of common sense in terms of how we spend our money? What can you do in your role to, to try to get that message across? Yeah, so, uh, well, I'm learning four months in, uh, in what I can do directly and what I uh, hopefully can influence. And um, the, the federal machine is a special one. Um, but if you just look at the infrastructure of child welfare from a federal level, is it's billions of dollars going into separating children from their families in order to have children return to their families, which seems like a really weird <laughs> strategy. Um, and part of what you know we're working through now is there was legislation that was passed. Um, family first about five years ago 
um, that was a start to being able to use some of those um, federal dollars that were only accessible if you used foster care and being able to open up a door to be able to use them at the front end with the strategy of trying to keep children out, out of foster care and with their families. And we can have lots of conversation about, is it working? It's in its early stages and there's lots of room for growth and improvement, but it is a shift of a conversation that I think is really important because the, the, foster care system, the child welfare system was actually built to do exactly what it was funded to do. And that was have a foster care um, system and pull children into foster care. And some of what is actually needed is in many ways, some really loud public will around doing something different. Um, There are lots of organizations and businesses that actually, um, have been built around having foster care. And it can be a scary and daunting notion to a business that your business model is is being proposed to go away. And so it's thinking about what can you do differently? Um, And there's plenty to do differently. It is how do we help have services and supports in communities um, where families can access it directly? How do we build, um, you know, networks of systems? The, for example, TANF itself, the first premise in TANF, which is a temporary aid for needy families, is help keep children with their families. But what we've done over time is focus on work. And that isn't to say that employment and work isn't important, but Often now systems are actually not using TANF as direct aid to families that need it. It has become in many ways a a benefit to use in all sorts of different places and spaces. And so I guess my premise is how do we work across our systems and actually knit ourselves together as a network that is a resource to a family when a family needs it in the way that they need it and with what they need. And so that means we've got to have the ability to work with um, families of different um, backgrounds, culture, uh, rural communities, metropolitan communities. And in many ways, I, I oftentimes phrase it as the systems have to do the system navigation so that families have access to what they need Um, because right now the onus falls on the individual or the community to figure out how to, how to go from agency to agency, system to system, not knowing anything about funding streams. That's a whole different (laughs) level of um, complexity and, and figure out how to find what they need, get access to what they need. And, And our systems right now are not built to actually help families do that navigation. So when we talk about foster care and doing something different, it it in some ways is a simple argument if you're going to look at it just from the premise of return on investment is, do we want to put the investment into a process and machine that we know actually doesn't yield us the outcomes we want for children and families, or are we gonna shift where our investment happens and see that continue to grow so that we're actually meeting families where they are um, in the way that they need it. So to that end, um, one of the main reasons I am so excited about you being here is we were talking to a room full of journalists and usually in a newsroom, the only way an editor is interested in a story about kinship care would be if a child is returned to the family and dies. That, yeah. That's the way journalists are trained. We're looking for the dissension, the tension, the problems, the wrongs. So I'm really pleased, <clears throat> excuse me, that you're joining us, particularly during National Foster Care Month, to offer us some insights into the kinds of stories that could have an impact. So I'll let you take it away at this point. Yeah, that's uh, so I appreciate it. Um, 
And uh, it's it's funny. I'm uh, I'm in Portland, Oregon right now um, this week, and so it's very early here. Um, <laughs> and uh, reflecting on this question, and I, and I'll start where you did around kinship care. Um, kinship care isn't something the child welfare system invented. Kinship care is actually what families and communities have been doing over the history of time. And, um, you know, it, what has become, um, what, what we've made it is that it's something in many ways kind of artificial. So there are families taking care of their family members and we just never know. And then there are circumstances where there might be um, challenges in a family of origin. So with the parent um, that brings an agency like child welfare into into the mix. And one of the things that we want to do is actually not have that child come into foster care and have them be with their family and figure out how do we support them. That can be challenging. And, you know, and it, it becomes this, um, this notion that we um, are fighting against that has been in place for, you know, this notion of the apple doesn't far, fall far from the tree um, in our value set that goes with family. And so breaking through that and um, recognizing that the trauma impact of separating children from their families is far greater than I think we ever knew with all of the brain science that we know now, um, being able to support kin as equal partners with us as we do with families that come to us and say, I want to be a foster parent or a resource parent. You'll hear me use those two terms interchangeably, where we'll pay strangers to take care of a child and meet their needs. And we're actually not paying people to do it. We're actually providing the financial supports in order to take care of a child. Um, and so um, if we're not willing to do that for, for relatives caring for family, then um, then, then we actually don't really want to change foster care. And I think that's really the premise. And we, um, this spring, had a proposed rule out and it's working its way through its final stages where we're creating opportunity for um, the Title IV E agencies, which are the child welfare agencies, to actually pay, <laughs> you have the same rate for um, a foster placement of a relative as we pay for foster parents. And that's, I think, a great opportunity. And the other pieces then also working then with our other systems, TANF being one example of how do we, even before foster care is, um, is an option or a consideration, what are the other spaces and places where we can provide some financial support? And here's a frame that I think is important to think about this because I've heard it, you know, as I grew up in doing the work of what's well, your relative, why should we pay you to take care of your relative? Well, I don't know about all of you in your room, but I know if my brother called me and said, I need help with my three kids, I would be absolutely willing in my heart, but wonder how am I financially going to feed three more children when I've got one in college and paying, you know, student loans and have the things that happen, you know, in life. And so in some ways, it's this, this expectation of um, that we put on families differently than we put on um, people who come forward for fostering. Um, the other piece that I'll say about, you know, stories that I would I would love to see is also stories about um, about the workforce, the the workforce, the people that come to do the work of child welfare. And that could be from someone who's, um, you know, greeting people at the door to someone who's serving as a caseworker or a social worker. They oftentimes come with very altruistic um, reasons of wanting to have an impact. Many people have experience either in their family or personally um, of either adoption, foster care, or kinship care. And I, the, first of all, 
the human services field does not get paid <laughs> um, at the at the level and at the value that they actually have a role in. We're talking about the ability to have generational impact on children, families, and communities. And it is oftentimes um, the one of the lower paying jobs, much like teachers. Um, and the, the workforce get, works. They oftentimes are working 24 hours a day, um, you know, with shift work and those sort of things. And I just am reflecting on the, the pandemic experience um, here is I had workers that were going out masked up and in the early days when it was the, you know, stay home um, uh, orders, they were, you know, geared up uh, head to toe and going and checking on on children and working with families um, and didn't, you know, don't receive hazard pay, don't receive kind of emergency first responder um, status sort of things. Those are sort of the things when I think about the, the value of the workforce that we haven't actually done a great job with in this country is acknowledging the, the day-to-day -day work that they do. Oftentimes, um, their children at home with their families while they are then serving other children and families. Um, and the ability to partner and collaborate, oftentimes we'll talk about child welfare as this kind of standalone entity. Um, and the truth of the matter is, is if we continue to kind of perpetuate that child welfare does this thing on their own and they're solely responsible for all the things, then we're never gonna get the outcomes that we want for kids and families. I rely on my health system, behavioral health, medical health. I rely on the education system. I rely on transportation um, for those that we're serving. And we've in many ways got to be better about, again, as I said earlier, working across systems to create pathways for um, how we're serving um, oftentimes the same people. Um, in a very disjointed way and finding ways to do that. And there's examples of that um, that are happening around the country. Um, the other part I would say is that there's some really great examples of community organizations and communities stepping up and, and being the partner and um, voice for, for um, families and communities and creating ideas and strategies. And the philanthropic community is a, an excellent partner. But I think some of it is, um, again, and um, <laughs> Rachel said this, it tends to not get the media attention. And I'm gonna be, I'll be the first one to admit that we haven't figured it all out. There are absolutely um, sometimes some really bad outcomes for kids and families that we're serving. It is, and not to minimize it, but it is a small piece of the other parts of the work that happen. But even in the tragedy, being able to, I think, talk about the spaces and places, and there are agencies that have been doing work around when something bad happens, how do they, um, how are they transparent with the data and the information? How are they um, communicating where there's needs for practice change and um, where things may have been better and making then improvements to their processes and being able to also tell that story of um, what, what do we learn in tragedy and how does it get applied to actually trying to prevent that tragedy from happening again. And I think that's um, an important through line. I um, would be remiss if I didn't um, kind of offer up, and I know that you heard from Sixto earlier um, this week, and um, I, I <laughs> he's one of my favorite people, um, but engaging with parents who have experienced the system as parents um, and successfully and not successfully had their children returned to them, um, I, you know, in Oregon, I had the pleasure of having a parent advisory council where um, they 
would talk about their experience of having a CPS worker show up at their door. They talked about the experience and what it felt like. Um, and when things didn't feel great based on how they were being treated or even the reality of the circumstances that they were facing with substance use and the recovery process. And I have parents and both mothers and fathers um, giving me input on policy and practice. And um, that is such an important, I think, storyline and opportunity for both um, from a media perspective, being able to um, pick up on the, the storyline of, um, you know, success through adversity, um, learning, you know, and, and, and the, the larger impact that people are, are having on systems. And that is also with young people. Um, <laughs> I spent um, some of my early career serving as a therapist. Um, and I had to step away from it when, when my oldest was a teenager and I realized I wasn't liking teenagers very much at the time. <laughs> um, and so I thought I was maybe doing a disservice to those teenagers who wanted to engage with me. Um, so I had to step away a little bit. Um, but I learned so much from the young people and, and being able to hear what an adolescent, a young adult is saying about what they want and what their experience is, and also being able to tell the story of the importance of connection and healing in that, um, in the response to our young people is so incredibly important. Um, and I'll give an example. Early on, Oh gosh, I keep saying early on. I make myself sound really old. Um, when I was younger and had less gray hair, uh, <laughs> I had the opportunity to be uh, uh, to serve as a director for a group home program, which I never, in my wildest dreams, ever envisioned I would be doing. Um, but I learned, and I was only there for a short period of time, but I learned so much that actually shaped really, I think, the, the next many um, decisions in my career that went forward is I sat there on Friday afternoons and signed many weekend passes for kids to go home and be with their families. And then they would come and sign themselves back in on Sunday evening. And I was just like, if they could go home and be with their family for two days, couldn't they go for seven? Couldn't they go for 14? Like, what is it that we're doing? Um, and so from a system lens, I was like, this is bananas <laughs> that we kind of have this system where we're, you know, created um, independent teenagers that are living on their own in apartments and navigating all of that when they've got family down the road that they could actually go stay with. Um, the other part of it is, is the adolescents in many ways, they were okay with it because I'm telling you, if I was 16 and someone said I could have an apartment, <laughs> I would have been all over it. <laughs> and so if thinking about, you know, are we actually incentivizing children staying disconnected from either their families or important adults um, that we know. And I think about this with my own, I talk about my kids like they're little, they're grown people, they're adults. <laughs> they're st they still call for money, so they get to be called kids sometimes too. Um, but I think about, I was a single parent, a young single parent with my son, and but for um, a network of people who looked out for me when I didn't know I needed looking out for, I may have ha been a parent with a kid in, involved in the child welfare system. And then as an adolescent, remember I told you I was not liking mine at the time, like <laughs> feeling like you don't know what to do. And, you know, fortunately I didn't have some of the challenges that many, um, families have and young people are going through a behavioral health, you know, the 
the behavior challenges and feeling, you know, physically unsafe with your un, your own child. I didn't have that. Mine was purely middle class <laughs> adolescent angst. Um, but I think about the not knowing where to go, not knowing and wondering if it's just me, um, you know, kind of going through this process and being able to support um, families in normalizing the things that we experience across a developmental pathway um, is, is important as well. Um, the value of kids being able to um, see themselves in others um, is, is equally important. So I started out with some of my adoption story and I'll share a little bit along the same line is I was 28 years old. Um, my son was seven. I was getting ready to get married. I finished grad school, moved back to the DC area and met this um, uh, man at my place of employment. He was part of an advisory council. So I walk in, but I was very bounced in at my in my 20s and was like, ah, Rebecca, I'm here to do great things. Um, and met this man, this African-American um, Native man, and we got to talking. We were the same age. In fact, our birthdays are a day apart. Um, and he was adopted also. And he started to share his story of being adopted um, by a white family and growing up isolated in this white community in New Mexico. And it was the first time in my life at 28 that I had this, and the only way I can describe it is this amazing sense of validation of like, oh, wow. Though, like, so when he would say something or I would share something and he would say, I know exactly what you mean. I knew he knew exactly what I meant. There's a sense of validation and um, belonging that comes with that. And, and, and we just really haven't done a really good job across the child welfare work of having that happen for families facing challenges, for children experiencing child welfare, um, and for resource and foster families doing the hard work of helping care for a child who's experienced trauma and harm. Um, and, and that's so, so important about making those connections. And so in kind of wrapping up this for me is it is being able to talk about belonging and connection and the heart of the work and not losing the humanity of those doing the work, but those experiencing these systems as well. And I think where you all can play a huge role is also pushing um, pushing this system out of status quo into transformation and change and towards what, you know, what, what I think is the direction that we need to go. And that is to actually investing all of these billions of dollars at our front end before the door of child welfare and making child welfare a, a system that is only responding to those families that absolutely need that type of intervention. And frankly, most of the families and kids don't need it. So um, I'll stop there and turn it back over to you, Rachel. I have so many questions, but then <laughs> I remembered, I have your cell phone number. So <laughs> I'm gonna let the journalists, are there any questions out here in the audience among the journalists? We'll start here. <laughs> what? <laughs> Yeah, uh, Rebecca, I'm going to start selling access to your uh, personal phone number. So <laughs> anyway, go ahead. Hi, thank you so much for this. Uh, my name is Jen Brooklyn. I report for the Detroit Free Press on child welfare. And I, I have many questions as well, but I will refrain from asking more than one right now, um, which is I, like probably my first week on the job, I got an email from someone almost using me as a complaint valve instead of, you know, I don't know, and saying, look, we have this family that they separated the kids, you know, they put them into foster care, they separated the kids, isn't this horrible? And then I got, it might've been in the same email, 
we have another family. It's so awful that the children have severe emotional. One of the children has severe emotional disturbances. They can't be around. You know, it, it, she's violent um, and is not safe to be. And they still they, they are keeping these kids together. Isn't that horrible? And it just I've seen that sort of repeated where one approach, you know, an approach to one family would be the opposite approach that you'd want to take for another family. So, at, you know, at a policy level, whether it's, you know, uh, federal or, or state, how do you navigate trying to create something that works for something that really an individualized approach is probably what's needed? How do you navigate that? Um, <laughs> that's a great question. And I, I think what, where I'll start is I think where where my view is, is that we have to, we have to navigate it on an individual basis and, and create decisions and pathways for the circumstance in front of us. Here's the thing is that child that is got emotional needs and those sort of things, those needs aren't necessarily going to get met because of child welfare, right? It is then the mental health and behavioral health system that um, needs to be involved. And so the question for me becomes is what's the right response and what is needed in that, in that moment for that circumstance? Is it that there's supports and services needed for the whole family to support the whole family being together? Is it a, a need for a particular service for that one young person while also helping that family navigate the challenges of caring for a young person um, with emotional um, emotional needs, um, and then and then thinking about you know in many ways it's like what are all the things we do before we come to separation, um, because that separation is. While sometimes necessary, it's a tear in the fabric um, of relationship that just isn't ever the same, even when it's short term, right? Um, even when it's necessary, it is a tear. And so in, in many ways, trying to think about what do you do with these other sort of systems and services before we get to a child welfare decision around, is this child safe at home? Um, yes or no, and then making decisions from there. Hopefully that answered your question. And it's not easy. Like there, that, I think that's where I go to the workforce, um, doing, doing this hard work is they're having to make those decisions, um, oftentimes in the moment and under pressure and under crisis, where I think if we get better and better at getting upstream and having people be able to access what they need before the crisis, um, it gets a little easier to um, to help find the right path than when it's screaming in your face. Since you mentioned that, another challenge that journalists often run into is they're told that they, uh, workers can't speak on the record or they're afraid to speak on the record because, you know, something could happen. So I wonder if it's even realistic to expect that the system could create, I don't know, communication between media and workers or rules could be lifted if that would have an impact or is it too risky to think about doing that? That's a tough one. Um, so I oftentimes like to say I pretend to be an attorney on TV. Um, <laughs> Uh, I am not an attorney, so I won't say that. But I think, you know, we are such a litigious country that, you know, att attorneys are, you know, oftentimes going to say, don't say anything and go through the, the legal route. Um, and I can't say that's necessarily right or wrong. What I will say that is if if we as the agency and the system and media are building relationships before the crisis, then there's a there's some trust built before it's you calling me because you know um, a, a child died or or you know there's this horrific circumstance that happened where we kind of go into protection mode. I've experienced really great relationships with media before. Um, and even when the thing when the things are hard to talk about, 
if you've got that relationship and understanding there are some things we won't be able to to say and share, but there's, I believe, certainly pathways to be able to have different kind of conversations around what the circumstances are. And frankly, you know, I'll put some of the onus on 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 you all in the media is that there are also lots of examples where workers' individual names end up in the paper. And then they get targeted by community and those sort of things. And no individual person, and I'm saying no in very kind of firm stances. And this, you know, my, again, asterisk and caveat is for the most part, decisions aren't made by a single person. There's, uh, there's a worker, a supervisor, maybe a program manager or director that are oftentimes um, involved in the decisions. And so, it um, becomes really scary for a caseworker to have their name in uh, in a headline or in a story about something um, bad that happened because they're going to worry about their livelihood and their job and their their reputation. And so that I believe that there's there's a there's a somewhere in between from not talking at all to having individual names named in there other than the director. Like my expectation would be, it would be my name as a director um, in a story and not my, you know, kind of entry level caseworker. Well, you know, it's interesting you say that because the reason I met you is because Kathy Bonk is involved in doing that kind of work with state agencies. So that brings me to one more question. Are there any other? Okay, well, I'll, I'll share the wealth here. Rachel, you've got to share. Yeah, I do. <laughs> Who's next? Hi, uh, hi, Commissioner. Thanks for, thanks for taking the time at this ungodly hour uh, for you. Um, and I don't think I've asked this of anyone since high school, but I would love your cell phone number. If you want to it. <laughs> well, um, I should say Eli is a pediatrician as well as a journalist. So if anybody would respect... Your uh, cell phone number would be him. Anyway, That's go ahead. Yeah, respect, respect a hell of a verb. Um, but um, my, my question, I, I sort of have two. Um, and, and they're a little bit maybe broader questions. The first question is about jurisdiction. Um, it seems to me that CPS um, really has, has uh, scarce limitations on its jurisdiction relative to other authorities um, in terms of its ability to uh, execute enforcement activities without warrants in terms of its ability to interpret uh, evidence from other counterparties and come to its own opinions. Um, for example, uh, its ability to adopt medical language and construe it as it pleases. And so I wonder if you would offer some comments on sort of why the jurisdiction of these agencies is so broad and what you think the effects of um, relatively unlimited jurisdiction uh, is in terms of how it sort of goes about what it does every day. Yeah, I, I appreciate the question and uh, I'm going to answer it in one way and then we can maybe have an offline conversation. <laughs> um, so the, the jurisdiction of child welfare has grown um, in many ways from, you know, what, what is in federal statute to then what plays out on the ground or state and local statutes um, and regulations. And it is interpreted differently. Um, you know, if you, we go back to, you know, where we started when all of this, you know, was created. So CAPTA was created in the, you know, 80s, early 90s. And, um we haven't, it hasn't really changed a whole lot since then, but state definitions of abuse and neglect have definitely um, kind of evolved over time. I think the other thing to keep in mind is that um, a, a lot of what child welfare does, so a CPS worker will do, is with the courts. And so the, the over, the presumed overreach, uh, <clears throat> And hearing my attorneys in my head, uh, the presumed overreach of the um, agency in many ways is fed, I think, by um, kind of public opinion, but also the the way that child welfare has evolved into a very legal system 
um, with court and legal jurisdiction. So that isn't necessarily a perfect answer to get to what you are saying. But what I will say is um, that's part of the challenge. That's part of the problem is that we've got, um, you know, a, a broad federal statute of what abuse and neglect is. And then at least 52, if not more, definitions of what that is on the ground, and then further interpretation um, of what it is, you know, and how it's playing out on the day-to-day -day between caseworkers, um, judges, attorneys. And that's part of the challenge, right? So the, the ills that we see, the challenges we see in um, our other kind of legally driven systems exist in child welfare as well. Um, and, you know, it's driven in large part by no one wants anything bad to happen to a kid on their watch. And so our response is, well, then we're just going to bring them all in. And that isn't the right answer either. Now, as far as the, um, the medical terminology you know, bringing that in. I think that varies in some ways from jurisdiction to jurisdiction. You have some workers um, that are um, master level and sometimes licensed, clinically licensed um, social workers that are at the, at the front and doing the CPS work. In other jurisdictions, you have people who don't have that clinical background um, there. And so I think it's probably a mix, but I, what I will offer also is open to, to ideas and things that you all are seeing on the ground um, that you know, might need some attention. And um, if there's ideas or examples that you have from your interactions with jurisdictions about how folks have made changes to that, I'm all ears and, and open to that insight and input as well. One more quick one and then we'll go to, oh, okay, go ahead, Nancy. Yeah, go ahead. Hi, uh, um, my name is Mary Flum. I'm with NBC News, and thank you so much for your time and your insights this morning. I wanted to ask you briefly, I worked on a couple of stories um, about, um, but first for Good Morning America a few years ago, and then just before the pandemic, another one for NBC, um, about the plethora of calls that you all get that come in, and the number of unfounded calls or this growth in for lack of a better term, kind of parent shaming and, you know, people calling your agencies for help with saying, you know, these, you know, some, you know, in one case, it was a heartbreaking story. I think it was in the Philadelphia area. You know, this poor woman was working full time and then she was going to school at night and, you know, the children were at these ages of like 12 and under, but she got called in. And, and that was one of a number of stories that we looked at. What are you seeing since the pandemic? I know you, you mentioned the CYA worries that some people have. And then I'm just wondering as well, just as a society, what we're seeing, I mean, is, is you all do such great work, but how problematic is it getting this plethora of calls, many of which may be unfounded, or in some cases, we also looked into um, these calls that were baseless and people just um, unfortunately um, trying to exact some kind of whatever on, on innocent people. How problematic are, are these unfounded calls to the important work that you do? Yeah, I, I appreciate the question. Um, it's such an important one. Um, if I'll, I'll put it in, in terms of if you had a story deadline that was five o'clock PM and it's noon, right? And you're frantically working up, I'm making this up from my experience of being a journalist, uh, ha ha, I'm not. <laughs> from all, this, all the ways it looks like on TV of, you know, frantically working up to the, the deadline, you've got a few hours left and your phone is ringing off the hook incessantly and you've got to answer it. You've got to answer it. You've got to answer it. And so you're chipping away at your ability to kind of really pay attention to this one story. And, you know, and I'm kind of joking around um, with you, but it is serious. And so I'll, I'll toss out some data that I, you know, know off the top of my head from Oregon. And 
you know, at one point, um, the hotline was getting um, about 17,000 calls a month. And 50% of them were not about reporting abuse or neglect. So that gets us down to, I can't do math now. So let's say 8,000 because I can do, I can do that math. Um, 8,000 calls are reporting, are calling because they're concerned possibly about abuse and neglect. Of those 8,000 calls, 50% of them immediately aren't, don't rise to the level of the definition for screening in, right? So then you've got 4,000 calls that, um, that are left. And of those 4,000, say you screen all of those in, maybe 500 end up being founded for abuse, but you've now had caseworkers out doing, starting investigations on families um, of 4,000 <laughs> families that end up in maybe 500 founded, um, meaning that there was enough evidence to say that there was um, abuse that happened. And of those 500, 100 of them kids end up in foster care. So you've gone from 17,000 down to 100 with the intervention that we have to offer. And it's a, someone is, a person is answering each of those 17,000 calls. And then you've got a limited workforce responding to the 4,000 where it then is deemed that 3,500 of those actually aren't abused. But now we've traumatized a family. We've, We've stretched our workforce because, of course, there's time limits on getting investigations done and all those sort of things. And then if the people calling about the family or the circumstance doesn't change, then we get more calls about the same family and the cycle continues. And some of those that end up being screened out, there are some uh, jurisdictional statutes that say after a certain number of calls, you have to screen it in. And the reason being that, you know, okay, we need to, maybe we need to go check and see that everything's okay. But it also then tells mandatory reporters, well, if I just keep calling, then something's going to happen. And again, where I started this morning was the something that people want to have happen isn't necessarily what child welfare has to offer. Um, it's because child welfare is going to make a decision. And I'm saying this in kind of very general um, terms because there are a lot of agencies and systems that are trying to make that evolution where they have alternative response or differential response, where they've got the ability to connect families with other agencies or organizations that are going to have the concrete supports um, but what we learned during the pandemic is that the concrete supports were life changing for people and that just because our phone calls went down didn't mean that abuse went up, right? And that, that things um, were happening um, differently for kids. And so I think the, the ability to get people to understand what is maltreatment and we can have that debate for an entire day, week, or month around what that definition is. But you know, going back to your your question, is the volume of calls? There's a finite number of people, and child welfare doesn't get to not answer the phone. Um, so, I, as I think about this, for example, you mentioned earlier that in some cases people questioned why a family would be paid more. Uh, you know, actual blood family than, than the foster family that has gone through training, has set up the whole program, et cetera, et cetera. And again, from a public perspective, it looks like it would just be common sense to help his birth family have more. But I'm wondering if it's a situation where different states get to make different rules, and even you and your position of prominence and power, you really, the government can't step in and impose uh, sanctions or, or, or control how different states handle these laws. Yeah, um, we don't get to be all 
all powerful. I would want to be. So let's be clear. <laughs> Um, it is it is a you know unique relationship between the federal government and and the states and there there are absolutely the federal government will provide some framework and then the states um, can uh, in some cases define it further or in some cases make decisions that they're not going to participate in it um, and so for example the example I shared earlier around the the um, pending proposed kinship rule is it's creating the opportunity for 4E agencies to create a licensing process for kin um, and setting some expectation that if you do that, then kin needs to be paid at the same rate as stranger foster care. It isn't requiring states to do it. And so some of what, um, you know, I think media can play a role in and certainly, you know, political will is, you know, uh, encouraging uh, jurisdictions to take up the, the things that are actually going to help keep kids and families together. Um, and, you know, there are some, again, the definition of abuse in, in CAPTA is a broad definition and then states get to create their state jurisdictional definitions. And the the interplay is there's interaction where we go in and we do case reviews and of course, you know, monetary reviews and those sort of things. It's an imperfect process. And you're just gonna get, there is absolutely variance from jurisdiction to jurisdiction. And, you know, and then you've got, um, states like New York or California that are county administered. And so then you have even more variance um, at the county level where they've taken, where it's gone federal to state to then county interpretation of how they're gonna do, um, do the work with their communities. Well, among the many powerful things you've shared with us this morning, I think the most is uh, our opportunity or responsibility to help shape the discourse around what needs to be done. I think you've provided all of us with lots of insights into what might be possible and ways that we can approach the story in a different way. And so I'm so very grateful to you for getting up at 5 a.m. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I wish you I told me. I got up at 4.30 because oh. I had to... I had to be camera ready. Uh, exactly. It takes me about an hour every morning. So I will, um, I just, I want to thank you. And I want to tell you that we will be calling on you in the future as we provide and develop more programming to help journalists understand this, this very important issue. So let's show Rebecca our gratitude for her joining us this morning. Thank you so much. Um, it, it, Thank you for inviting me. This was, I was excited to be invited. And I absolutely believe that um, uh, you all play an important role in um, the narrative of how people understand um, what's happening in the world and what's happening in child welfare, particularly, and setting setting some expectation about where, where we need to go um, in ways that isn't necessarily always gotcha. Um, but, uh, you know, in partnership and being able to talk about the things that are going well and um, the changes that are happening. So I thank you for all the work that you all do. Well, you take care and get in touch when you get back to D.C. I will definitely do that. I'm going to go have coffee now. OK, great. Take care. Bye bye. Bye.